Good evening, everybody. I'm Carter Sneed. I'm a I'm the I'm a professor of law here at the University of Notre Dame, where I also have the honor and privilege of directing the De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture, uh, which is the host uh, of this event today. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's conversation on the unbroken thread, discovering the wisdom of tradition in an age of chaos by Sora Bamari. I'm delighted to be joined this afternoon by my dear friends and respected colleagues for what I'm sure will be a great conversation on a timely book. Before we turn to today's program, I just wanna say a quick word about our work. The De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture is committed to sharing the richness of the Catholic moral and intellectual tradition through teaching, research, and dialogue at the highest level and across a range of disciplines. Through our work in student formation, academic research, service, and supporting the university's institutional commitment to building a culture of life, we promote the distinctive Catholic mission on campus at Notre Dame and bring its voice into the global public square as Notre Dame. To that end, we are so pleased to be hosting this conversation on the unbroken thread, which takes up the important question of how tradition can anchor and orient us at this deeply vexed and disorienting moment in our individual and shared lives. And you'll hear a lot from uh, the author as well as our commentators this evening, but I just wanted to express my own gratitude to So Rob for writing this beautiful book. It's such a terrific uh, contribution. Uh, and, but mostly my gratitude comes uh, as a dad. As the father of three boys, uh, I have the same hopes and fears and concerns and aspirations and, and desires around my boys that he, he does around his children. And as his son, Max, was the primary motivating uh, source of inspiration for this book, uh, I'm happy to have this as a resource uh, to keep my sons, all three of my sons, hands on the thread as well as they feel their way to the fabric, to use that beautiful metaphor that runs throughout your book, to keep them anchored and close to truth and goodness and beauty uh, throughout their lives and a life, uh, a life that is increasingly characterized by by chaos and disorientation. So thank you, so Rob, for writing this important book that is necessary for, for everybody, but especially for us parents. Um, a quick uh, uh, items for housekeeping before we, before we proceed. First of all, webinar participants uh, will see a Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. You're welcome to submit questions there for our speakers at any time, and we will pose them to the panel later in the session. Also, for those interested in purchasing a copy of The Unbroken Thread right here, uh, the Notre Dame Bookstore is pleased to offer a 20% discount on the purchase price through its release date next Tuesday, May 11th. So be sure to visit their website, the Notre Dame uh, uh, Bookstore website, after this event to reserve your copy. I'm delighted that we have one of our wonderful De Nicola Center Soren Fellows, uh, Nick Abusha did with us here today uh, to introduce our panelists. Following his introduction, we'll hear from Sorub and our three guests, and then I'll return for a more informal conversation with our panelists. Nick majors in the program of liberal studies in Mandarin here at the University of Notre Dame, where in addition to being one of our 300 Soren Fellows of the De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture, he's also a Tocqueville Fellow of Professor Munoz's Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government, another wonderful initiative of the University of Notre Dame, led by our fantastic colleague, Professor Munoz, who we'll hear from shortly. Uh, last year, Nick was the editor-in-chief of Notre Dame's independent student-run newspaper, The Irish Rover, and he's currently at work on his dissertation on philosophy and tradition and Newman's idea of a university. I'll turn things over to Nick now. Thanks, Professor. R.R. R. Reno is the editor-in-chief of First Things Magazine, a former professor of theology at Creighton University, and the author of several books, the latest of which, is the return of the strong gods, nationalism, populism, and the future of the West. Raised an Episcopalian, he converted to Catholicism in 2004, reflecting a decade later that in the end, as an Episcopalian, I needed a theory to stay put. And I came to realize that a theory is a thin thread, easily broken. I'm especially eager to hear his thoughts on the book bringing us together today, given his own discovery of the Catholic Church's unbroken thread. Mary Eberstadt is an essayist, novelist, and author of several nonfiction books, including Primal Screams, How the Sexual Revolution Created Identity Politics. She's the inaugural holder of the Paniel Chair at the Catholic Information Center, 
and a senior fellow at the Faith and Reason Institute. Information about her books and other work can, can be found on her website, maryeverstadt.com. In a 2013 talk on the myths of the sexual revolution, she noted that she thinks the best way to confront the kind of prejudice against tradition and religion so characteristic of our age is not by playing defense, but by playing offense. I was struck with how forthcoming she was about her aim. I mean to arm you, she told her undergraduate audience. I wonder if she recon recognizes that aim in a book confronting an age of chaos. Vincent Philip Munoz teaches political science and constitutional law here at Notre Dame, focusing on religious liberty and the American founding, as reflected in his book, God and the Founders, Madison, Washington, and Jefferson. Professor Munoz is also the founding director of the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government, which he's confessed is nothing short of an effort to save the American Republic. For us students, Professor Munoz is a devoted mentor whose magnanimity pushes us to live for high ideals, especially when it means swimming against the current. His influence from the campus all the way to the Supreme Court testifies to the wisdom of tradition. And Sora Bamari, among other things, is the op-ed editor of the New York Post and is joining us today to discuss his upcoming book, The Unbroken Thread, Discovering the Wisdom of Tradition in an Age of Chaos. According to the book's blurb, Amari is a radically assimilated immigrant to the United States. Having read his work and made, and made his acquaintance, however, I'd say that his, his assimilation to America is radical, not especially in its rejection of his native culture or anything like that, but in that his love for his adoptive country finds its source and completeness in his participation in the kingdom of God. And that is a radical thing indeed. His book officially comes out on May 11th, and I'm sure he'd appreciate our prayers up until then. Saurabh, my friend, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Nicholas, for that kind introduction. I was very pleased to meet you um, earlier this year. And um, let me also thank uh, the, the Nicholas Center and especially Professor Carter Sneed for giving me this opportunity. This is, in fact, my first book launch book talk. Um, and it's, it's just a special pleasure to, to do it uh, via Our Lady's Own University. Um, I will, I know our time is limited, so I, I just wanna uh, thank the other panelists as well and then tell you a little bit about the impetus for why I wrote this book. Professor uh, uh, Sneed already hinted at it. Uh, when I was in my 20s, uh, childless and unmarried, I had never thought about the questions that are posed in this book because it seemed to me that the order or the cultural arrangements that um, I found myself in were built for people like me. And indeed they were. I was just you know, traveling the world, uh, working as, a, as an editorial writer for the Wall Street Journal in London. I could uh, you know, be, work in London uh, on a Friday, be in Paris to party or um, uh, have, a, have a meal, and then again, go back to London within eight hours and all that dynamism seemed so attractive. But then a couple of things happened. Uh, one was my conversion to Roman Catholicism at age 31, which is a separate story. And the other one was uh, my wife and I uh, expected our first child, Maximilian. And um, I had to think about what kind of solidity or what permanent things I would be handing on to him. And suddenly all that dynamism came under question for me. And frankly, this book is a book uh, written out of a kind of parental uh, fatherly anxiety or fear even of about the kind of person that our civilization will chisel out of my son. It, he was two years old when I started writing it. He's now four years old. His, he's named after St. Maximilian Kolbe, the great um, saint of Auschwitz who laid down his life for a stranger uh, in, the con in the Nazi concentration camp. And... Um, I, 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 in the thread, in the metaphor, essentially, that is the, the, ties the whole book together and is in the title, is my attempt to try to bind him to the traditions that led a Franciscan friar to, to perform this remarkable act of Christian freedom, uh, where in a situation in which there's very little choice about uh, what you can do as a prisoner at Auschwitz, you can be the freest man in Europe, in a sense, by choosing to die for in, 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 play, in a sacrificial way for someone else. 
Um, and so, and so how do I reinforce the thread that would tie my son to his, uh, his uh, namesake and patron saint? Um, I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a theologian, I'm a journalist and a storyteller. And so I had to think about telling the story of this deeper account of uh, freedom that sustained someone like Kolbe over against our account of contemporary account of freedom that says that to be free means to be nearly unrestricted. And uh, uh, if you're unrestricted and have maximal choice among contraries, that means you're, you're free. This is a impoverished account of freedom and I need to tie my son to a deeper account of freedom. So how do I do that? I pose 12 questions, 12 questions that our kind of contemporary modernity imagines has been overcome or have been supplanted by um, the findings of science, this, uh, the technological advancements we have and are no longer worth asking when indeed they are still absolutely pertinent to a free and happy life. And so to give you a taste of the book, I will just read a little bit I, it, be, for a book that's uh, just being launched. Unfortunately, I, I can't just sort of uh, uh, comment on it freely. I, I still have to rely on, on a, a piece of the prose, but I hope you'll find it compelling and it'll give you a taste of the book. And so this is from a chapter, trust me, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but a chapter titled, um, Why Does God Want You to Take a Day Off? So it begins, in 2019, North Dakota lawmakers abolished their state's Sunday trading ban. Going back to the 19th century, business owners had faced jail time and a fine for keeping their doors open Sunday mornings. It was America's last statewide blue law, and it went the way of the rotary phone and the airplane smoking section. The bill's main GOP sponsor in the Senate, in the state legislature, I apologize, claimed that a majority, quote, wants to make decisions for themselves ending the ban, officials argued, would boost shopping and with it revenues. So who but a few scolds could complain? The share of Americans who don't identify with any religion continues to grow. And even many believers reject the concept of the Sabbath as a divinely ordained day of rest. Instead, we're encouraged to pursue lives of action and purpose, and we do. Americans turn away from the Sabbath has been going on for a long time. In the mid 20th century, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, one of America's foremost Jewish thinkers, wrote about the Sabbath in terms of, quote, the realm of time and the realm of space. Modern life is all about conquering space, winning geopolitical territory, growing and prospering economically. But the danger begins, Heschel worried, when, quote, in gaining power in the realm of space, we forfeit all aspirations in the realm of time. In that realm, the goal is not to have, but to be, not to own, but to give, not to control, but to share, not to subdue, but to be in accord, end quote. Many of his American co-religionists in those days saw the ritual as an impediment to freedom, the freedom to shop, work, and social, socialize as much as they wanted. For, for Heschel, this brand of freedom was missing something profound. It barred entry to an entire dimension of existence, namely time, whose passage reminds us that everything is contingent Everything passes away, everything that is, except God. The Sabbath, Heschel taught, th thought, is the guarantor of our inner liberty, while restless Sabbathless societies could descend easily into tyranny and barbarism. This was a lesson that Heschel, um, as a Polish born Hasidic Jew, had learned firsthand. Uh, uh, he was born in 1907 in Tsarist uh, ruled Warsaw where traditional and Jewish, modern Jewish currents converged and clashed. He was a prince of that traditional Jewish world, heir to Polish and Lithuanian Hasidic dynasties and formed from an er early age to become a, a rabbi. Ordained as a rabbi indeed at age 16, he went on to seek secular learning. And in 1927, he enrolled as a philosophy student at the University of Berlin. The golden age culture of Weimar Germany was in full swing but Heschel, for the most part, kept his nose in his studies. The skeptical spirit dominated his chosen field, the philosophy of religion. The scholars Heschel encountered in those days didn't ask, what does this biblical text tell us about God or morality, but rather, what do these claims about God and morality tell us about the culture that produced the supposedly sacred text? In such circumstances, holding fast to his forefathers' faith proved taxing. But one night in the early 1930s, 
while st strolling Berlin's magnificent streets, Heschel had a breakthrough. Suddenly, I noticed the sun had gone down, quote, evening had arrived. He had forgotten about time. He should have been preparing for the evening prayer. Quote, I had forgotten God. I had forgotten Sinai. I had forgotten that sunset is my business. The sunset reminded Heschel of his task as a believer and a faithful Jew, namely to, quote, restore the world to the kinship of the Lord. And fired up by this awakening, he would go on to write a dissertation on the Hebrew prophets that reversed the, quote, secular humanist humanistic project of his time, as his biographer Edward Kaplan tells us. His God-centric understanding, he came to believe, was the only sure guarantee of human dignity without an absolute standard that reflected the will of a supreme being, people could countenance any evil. Everything could be relativized. And it wasn't merely enough to contemplate this supreme being, rather the God-centric vision had to be nurtured in a life of prayer and ritual. That is to say, in the dimension of time and in the Sabbath. I go on to explain that uh, Heschel faced uh, the first anti-Semitic attack in uh, in Germany, which was the um, April 1st, 1933 uh, boycott of Jewish businesses. And he noticed that this, the, the boycott took place on a Saturday, on the Sabbath, and the timing wasn't lost on him. He published an anonymous Yiddish language poem during that time, pouring scorn on the Nazis. Quote, on Sabbath day at 10 o'clock, a filthy brown mass of people sat on shoulders, on doorsteps, on thresholds. Gut Yantif, happy holiday in Yiddish purebred Germans. So he then goes on and he's expelled from, uh, from Germany um, and goes to Poland. Uh, he's rescued uh, by uh, 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 Hebrew Union College. The president at the time had noticed him because he was, his uh, prophetic voice in Europe was um, uh, gaining him a renewed attention. And so he, set, uh, he was rescued in a sense, but not before um, much of his family perished in the Holocaust. Uh, he, in, in fact, uh, uh, he couldn't save much of his Warsaw kin at all. His mother died of a heart attack when Nazi troops stormed her apartment in the Warsaw ghetto. One sister perished under Nazi bombing. Two others were murdered in the German death camps. Two of the six million Jews immolated in the fire of an altar to Satan, as he famously wrote. Today, Heschel is best remembered for his political activism in the United States during the 1960s. He vociferously opposed the Vietnam War, marched arm in arm with Martin Luther King Jr. was the only Jew to eulogize the civil rights leader at his funeral. His lifelong hatred of injustice was foremost an outpouring of this piety. That piety was nurtured in Hasidic soil and cultivated by German philosophy, but it clashed with the spirit of American Judaism. With few exceptions, his students uh, in America struck him as ill-read, shallow, inattentive to interior things. And they in turn seemed to have found in him an irascible, and hard to understand figures straight out of central casting for eccentric old world academic. And his, the, his students' shortcomings, he thought, mirrored the spiritual state of the United States as a whole, its relentlessly practical sensibility, its impatience with the contemplative life. Americans were very much prepared to abandon the realm of time, the realm of the Sabbath, in conquering the realm of space. Yet it hadn't always been so. In earlier times, a robust Protestant tradition disciplined America's commercial drive. Sabbatarianism, the notion that the law must uphold Sunday as a day of rest and worship, was taken for granted in colonial America as much in the supposedly secular uh, Virginia colony as in Puritan New England. Leading American statesmen and clergy in the post-revolutionary period, in fact, framed the observance of the Sabbath as an essential bulwark against the depravities that had marked the French Revolution, a bulwark that would protect the American Revolution from such depravities. Yet Sabbatarianism wasn't forceful enough to stop the Federal Postal Service from delivering mail on Sundays, a fact that drew the ire of Protestant leaders, not least because the post offices had become places for men to drink and to carouse. Economic and partisan considerations repeatedly blocked legislative attempts to ban Sunday mail de delivery throughout the 19th century. Facing the objection that so stopping delivery on Sundays would hurt the national economy, uh, a New Jersey state senator, apologies, a New Jersey senator pointed out that, quote, a busy commercial center such as London took Sundays off without apparent problem, as the historian Gillis Harp has written. But even if, it, if there were some financial loss, he added, America shouldn't, quote, 
measure public worth by dollars and cents and shouldn't tolerate this national profanation. It would take the alliance of a nascent labor movement and the spiritual uh, heirs of that Protestant tradition to finally end Sunday mail delivery in 1912, yet the 20th century saw the death of the American Sabbath by a thousand cuts, as states began to permit localities to liberalize so-called blue laws. Until they began, and usually they began by permitting recreational activities that didn't amount to quote, servile labor, such as baseball or horse racing, so that even as the Supreme Court repeatedly upheld Sunday trading bans on constitutional grounds, the days of stores being uh, sternly shuttered on Sundays were soon over. Now even the US Postal Service delivers mail on Sundays again for Amazon. Before Heschel ever denounced the injustices that disfigured America, he deplored the commercialized technocratic way of life that denied time to the Sabbath. What his industrious fellow Americans might have mistaken for wasted time was in fact an absolutely necessary act. In biblical logic, holiness always requires sacrificial abandonment. Something must be handed over to God. And this logic of sacrifice is at work in an especially tangible way in the Sabbath. As Heschel wrote, he who wants to enter the holiness of the day must first lay down the profanity of clattering commerce, of being yoked to toil, end quote. It's difficult to imagine how revolutionary the Sabbath vision must have appeared in the ancient world where vast multitudes of people were slaves. Into such a world, there appeared a religion that told slaves that they had an identity separate from their labor, that their non-work was sacred. Judaism taught men and women to find inner liberty by freeing themselves from, quote, domination of things, as well as from domination of people, as Heschel observed. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all appreciated the bond between Sabbath restrictions and human freedom, even as they de de designated different days to be holy. Across the West today, however, the drive toward maximal market liberty has squeezed out the liberty of the Sabbath. We've banished it in the name of choice, and some choice we have. Working class families are denied even a half day of rest together, yet we're puzzled by astronom astronomical divorce rates, abysmally low rates of family formation, alienation, and drug abuse. We've cashiered the Sabbath for algorithmic human resources scheduling, computer code designed to minimize labor costs, regardless of the impact on families and communities. In our day, as in Heschel's, a world without a Sabbath is a world without a soul. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel celebrated his final Sabbath on Friday, December 22nd, 1972. As usual, the dinner was attended by friends who read aloud from the Yiddish poems Heschel had written while forging his biblical thought in the crucible of the Holocaust. The next morning, he didn't wake up. His daughter, Susanna, has written, in the Jewish tradition, dying in one's sleep is called a kiss of God, and dying on the Sabbath is a gift that is merited by piety. Thank you very much. So thank you, uh, Sorab and Nicholas and all. I was uh, inspired enough by Sorab's book that I wrote out my brief remarks. First, I'd like to congratulate him on the new book. It's wise, full of inspirational stories, and it's both powerfully argued and entertaining to read. <clears throat> That's a rare combination of literary virtues. The Unbroken Thread is also a fine example of apologetics without apologizing and of serious learning handled lightly. The book's tone and sweep reminded me of Will and Ariel Durant's classic works uh, they were two of the 20th century's best popularizers and defenders of Western Civ, especially when Western Civ has come under overt, if increasingly ill-informed attack, <clears throat> we've needed more writers like them. The Unbroken Thread is a spirited addition to the club. I would like to offer three brief reflections on the book's argument <clears throat> for openers. First, in addition to its sure success in ruffling feathers in all the best places, its thesis has the benefit, <clears throat> excuse me, of being right, right and elemental. As the author says, putting into words the fears that many parents have today, what kind of man will contemporary Western culture chisel out of my son? That is a question before every parent and every person who cares about the United States to come. Once upon a time and not that long ago, many people would have answered, 
that creating a better America <clears throat> was simple. One needed only to supply more and more freedom. By 2021, the virtue of that answer is far from self-evident. More freedom and less regulation helped to fuel, not ameliorate, the opioid and heroin and fentanyl crises. As Saurabh shows, more freedom and less regulation also have not diminished the pornography that poisons kids and wrecks romances. <clears throat> As he notes more generally, it is liberalism's unthinking promise of more freedom, meaning in practice, it's reckless undermining of all authority that laid the groundwork for today's cancel culture. To the extent that we do need more freedom in certain senses today, such as more genuine free speech, it is to correct what license and not the absence of license created in the first place. Second, this book is something the world needs in another sense. It is an act of posterity. It is a handing down of distilled truths pursued and thrashed out at personal cost for the benefit of someone who cannot yet understand them. In that sense, the book is profoundly conservative. In a moment when many Americans fret over what conservatism means, we can say with certainty that one thing it means is this, conservatives care about posterity. They care about our magnificent, albeit sometimes troubled national heritage, and they care about the human beings born and unborn who will someday take the place of those of us leaving carbon footprints today. Third, it also seems to me that in devising this act of posterity, Saurabh hits, as he so often does, on one of the deepest fault lines of our time. I will dub that the posterity gap. The haves and have nots of our age are not those of yesterday's material world. Today's gap is an over bling. And at the rate of exciting people who might fruitlessly try to DM me on Twitter, it isn't only about race or gender either. Rather, Americans seem fundamentally split between those who believe that our past abounds with civilizational treasures, heroes, and traditions that we should pass on, and those who disdain and would trample underfoot in rage every last one of those things. The idea that the religious, moral, philosophical, and other traditions of the West are not treasures is one of the most lethal of our times. It's been contaminating the humanities for over half a century now, and it's brought forth something inimical to humanity itself. Legions of people, most of them young, who believe that everything predating them is a useless social construct. Those people, more than any others, need the knowledge and wisdom of the past, including, as Saurabh distills it in this wonderful book, Confucius, Augustine, Aquinas, and the rest are way better companions for them than the self-dealing hucksters and the wounded psyches who govern so much of our conversational agenda today. Young people are being fed lies about civilization because the authorities around them don't care if they find a way to a good and fulfilled life or not. So let's hope that they find their way to this book and to other works that aspire to positive truths and not negative lies. And if those who argue on behalf of tradition take flack for it, as we all do, so be it. Cowardice and self-censorship are getting old. The emboldened counterculture to come is just getting started and the unbroken thread helps to pick up the pace. Thank you, Saurabh. Thank you, uh, uh, Mary, for those uh, very nice comments. Um, thank you to Nicholas for the kind introduction. Uh, thanks to the De Nicola Center and uh, my good friend Carter Sneed. Um, Carter and the, the Center 
are a great uh, force for good here at Notre Dame. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to participate in the center's events. And of course, uh, thanks to Sarab Amari who, for giving us a, a reason uh, to get together this afternoon. Uh, Sarab has written an absolutely uh, delightful book. Uh, it's engaging, informative, easy to read, uh, elegantly written. Uh, if you're looking for a graduation present, this being uh, the season, uh, it would make a perfect gift uh, for your college student. Uh, the world college students are entering, uh, Amari argues, is uh, in a word, degenerate. It offers freedom without responsibility, choice without reason, uh, an autonomy that actually enslaves. Uh, Amari writes as an immigrant. His introduction explains, uh, recalling a theme from his earlier book, uh, From Fire by Water, uh, another book I would recommend to you, uh, that he radically assimilated to America and its Western ways eagerly escaping what he considered the traditional backwards of his Iranian homeland. I, I thought I might just read you a, a paragraph from the first page, um, since you probably haven't had a chance to read the book yourself. Uh, Sarab writes, this is uh, the third paragraph. Once I immigrated to the United States, I reveled in the chance to remake myself anew every day. My moral opinions were as interchangeable as my clothing styles and my musical tastes. I could pick up and drop this ideology or that. I could be a high, high school goth, a college socialist, a law school neoconservative. I could dabble in drugs and build an identity around my dabbling. I could get a girlfriend, cheat on her, dump her willy-nilly, and then build a pseudo identity around that too. All along, it outraged me to recall that there were people still trapped in societies that didn't permit such experiments in individual self-determination. It turns out, however, that inventing uh, oneself and reinventing oneself is exhausting and it doesn't actually lead to an identity. Uh, as often happens to young, pan, young men who see what living uh, without restraint really means, uh, Mari sought a better path, uh, prompted as he uh, mentioned uh, in his uh, uh, opening remarks, prompted by his conversion to Catholicism, uh, his marriage, and then especially the birth of his son he sought to discover the wisdom uh, of tradition and to escape a life of chaos. The Unbroken Thread, the, the book we're discussing, shares a few of the lessons that Amari has learned. Um, my, my time too is brief, so let me share a few of my thoughts about what I liked about the book and then a reservation or two uh, about the project. Um, I absolutely love the format. Each chapter provides a provocative question and then it uses a story from a figure of history to point us toward an answer to that question. C.S. Lewis helps Amari answer the question, how to justify your life. Thomas Aquinas answers, is God reasonable? John Henry Newman uh, answers, should you think for yourself? And Solzhenitsyn answers, what is freedom for? Uh, the book uh, asks great questions, questions that a thoughtful college student uh, actually asks. Amari shows us that there's wisdom in the past, that tradition can still speak to us if we are willing to listen. Though the book is not meant to be a defense of liberal education, it's a testament to how great books and even some not so great books can help us live our lives more reflectively if we let them. And it shows us that we need not identify with an author or share his or her sin, uh, skin color uh, to learn from his or her writings. For some young people, the unbroken thread will serve as an introduction to these past thinkers. Uh, this reason alone is a reason uh, I would encourage you to, to buy it, especially for a, a young person. I don't mean to suggest that there are no gems for readers of a mo more advanced age. Um, personally, I, I especially like chapter 10. Uh, in that chapter, Amari uses the feminist Andrea Dworkin to answer the question, is sex a private matter? She's not quite a traditionalist, but uh, Amari has a very interesting take on her. Uh, chapter 11 uh, asks the question, what do you owe your body? Uh, this chapter introduced me to the 20th century philosopher, Jewish philosopher, Hans Jonas. I, I, I had heard of him, but really didn't know much about him. And the chapter provides a remarkably clear summary of both Heidegger and Gnosticism. Okay, I, I could go on with my praise and, and there really is much more to praise, uh, but I think I was, put on this panel to offer a few criticisms. So let me make a turn to that direction. 
Uh, I think there's something somewhat ironic about the book. It praises tradition, but the book itself is not situated in a particular tradition. Indeed, it offers a rather cosmopolitan take on tradition. Uh, in addition to Aquinas and Andrea Dworkin, Confucius serves as a, as a guide. I don't mean to say there's anything wrong with that. I, I actually think the book's ecumenical and multicultural chapters are strengths, in my opinion. But it is an odd way to defend tradition. Indeed, the book's cosmopolitan character might actually be read as an implicit critique of traditionalism. A second irony, there's not, not much from the American political tradition. And here the book's uh, sin is really uh, more of an act of omission than commission. There are wonderful chapters just waiting to be written on the nature of democracy. One chapter might have been titled, Is Democracy Always Good? Uh, America's first constitution, the Articles of Confederation, of course, failed. Among other things, it was too democratic. Uh, individual states were too strong and the national government was too weak. The founders quickly learned that for democratic government to be good government, local democracy is not enough. Right? But democratic government isn't necessarily good. Uh, Jefferson, in his first inaugural address, uh, said, all too will bear in mind this sacred principle that, the, that though the will of majority is in all cases to prevail, that will to be rightful must be reasonable, that the minority possesses their equal rights, which equal law must protect, and to violate would be oppression. A main theme of the book is the necessity of limits, that freedom unrestrained is not freedom at all. Founders learned this lesson too, and they devised a constitution, a constitutional republic accordingly. So Omari might have used the founders to remind us of the limits of democracy. And the figure he could have used here is George Washington. Washington put his enormous prestige behind the Constitutional Convention by presiding over it. Everyone knew that George Washington would be the first president. There's no doubt in the minds of many Americans, um, there's no doubt that in the minds of many Americans, it was worth taking a chance uh, on the new constitution because Washington was behind it and Washington would be the first to govern under it. The founding generation appreciated, just like Amari, the need for authority, both in law and lawmakers, and also the need for heroic character and the necessity of virtue, even in a republic. Another chapter could have been titled, Can a Democratic People Choose Anything? Amari here might have used the Lincoln-Douglas debates to illustrate the limits of democratic choice. The issue between Lincoln and Douglas was what to do about slavery in the federal territories, the issue, one of the issues of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Uh, Stephen Douglas was the first pro-choice politician. Uh, who was he to judge, he said? Who was anyone really to judge whether slavery was right or wrong? In a democracy, Douglas said, the people decide everything. Uh, let me just put a, up a quote from what Douglas said about slavery. He says, it's no answer to this argument to say that slavery is an evil and hence should not be tolerated. You must just allow the people to decide for themselves whether it is a good or an evil. At the end, whenever you put a limitation on the right of any people to decide what laws they want, you have destroyed the fundamental principle of self-government. So Douglas's policy was to let every state and every territory decide for itself whether to have slavery Lincoln understood the American constitutional, far, constitutional tradition far more deeply than did Douglas. He understood that it was premised on the idea of equality, that the truth, that, the truth that all men are be, being, all human beings are equally endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And this meant that there are limits on what a democratic people may legitimately choose. So let me put up a quote from uh, Abraham Lincoln here. The doctrine of, and he's referring to Douglas's uh, popular sovereignty doctrine here, the doctrine of self-government is absolutely right, eternally, uh, absolutely and eternally right, but it has no just application as here attempted. Or perhaps I should say that whether it has such just application depends upon whether the Negro is not or is a man. If he is not a man, why in that case he who is a man may as a matter of self-government do just as he pleases with them. But if the Negro is a man, is it not to that extent a total destruction of self-government to say that he too shall not govern himself? When the white man governs himself, that is self-government. But when he governs himself and also governs another man, that is more than self-government. 
that is despotism. My ancient faith teaches me that all men are created equal and that there can be no moral right in connection with one man's making a slave of another. Lincoln understood the moral foundations of American republicanism, that natural rights were bounded by the natural law and that the people accordingly were limited in their legitimate authority. Had Amari turned to the founders in the American constitutional tradition, he might have answered the question posed in his chapter six differently. Uh, in that chapter, Amari asks, does God need politics? Uh, following my friend and uh, colleague here at Notre Dame, Patrick Sedin, Amari contrasts the flaccid politics of liberal neutrality with the spiritually elevated politics of a society ordered to the true higher, highest good. St. Augustine is Amari's choice to defend uh, the politics concerned with the spiritual good. And he uses this to criticize liberalism's banishment of religion to the private sphere. But here I think Amari offers a false dichotomy. The alternatives are not the uh, theocratic polis on the one hand and liberal neutrality on the other. There's a third way, the founder's path. And that path was to limit the scope of political authority in order for religious authorities to assume their rightful position in society. And speaking about religious liberty, James Madison said that we have a political right among men because we have a higher, because we have higher religious duties to God. Now I've dwelt upon uh, these themes of American democracy and the American democratic tradition because they actually fit Amari's larger thesis, that authentic freedom is bounded that what is proper to man is communion with God, not autonomy from nature and the natural law. So perhaps my criticisms really are not criticisms of the book that Sarab has written, but rather an invitation to apply his wonderful talents to America and American history. Should he do so, I think he might find that there's much wisdom to be gained in the principles of the country that has become his home, a country that so desperately needs support from men like him if we are to survive this age of chaos. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to, um, I'd like to echo uh, the praise uh, that both Mary and, and Philip have, have offered for the book. Um, it's just beautifully written and it's warm with personality because of the method that Saurabh has taken of using individual figures to illustrate the thematic point of each chapter. So I, I, I would commend that. Now, when I, for my comments though, I would like to, like, to, like to frame what I take to be the main thrust of the book in my own um, theological terms. Uh, if we look at one section of the book towards the end, Sarab gives us his kind of summary of, of where we've been over the course of these many chapters. And here's what he says. At each step, we witnessed the strange working out, the working out of a strange paradox, how across life's realms, the push for ever greater human mastery has degraded humanity's real stature, put us at odds with nature and our fellow human beings and frustrated our longings for community and for truth. And that what Philip said that the thesis of the book is that not, not only has this drive for limitless mastery uh, led us astray, but that the path forward is a recovery of a proper sense of limits. And, and this put me in mind of, my, I, I wanted to reflect in my own mind about, my, about the theological tradition. And it put me in mind of the John the Baptist's, what he says at the begin, in the beginning of the Gospel of John, he's announcing the coming of the Messiah. And he says, make straight the way of the Lord. And this is a passage from Isaiah chapter 40 that goes on to speak about how every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain shall be laid low. And what this is in the book of Revelation reiterates this because at the end of the book of Revelation, you get an account of the heavenly city of Jerusalem and it's flat as a pancake. And so you get a biblical view of 
the, uh, redemption as a removal of the impediments of life, the twisty, windy roads, the up and downs of the mountains. And instead, we are able to reach our final end without impairment. And I think the modern age draws on this Christian notion of remove that human life seeks to remove impediments and to smooth out the difficulties of life. So there's what um, uh, there's a, a there's there's a immunization of the eschaton, um, as Eric Foglin put it, and you see this in someone like Descartes. Descartes wants to knock down the old Gothic house of knowledge. It's got its additions and back staircases, and it's just hard to navigate through the old house of knowledge that's grown up uh, by uh, uh, the accretion of tradition over the centuries. He wants to knock it down and then build a new house of knowledge that will be much more efficient and so on and so forth. And we see that in political thinking too, John Locke wants us to navigate according to the pure light of the state of nature, or even more radically, someone like Jeremy Bentham with a single principle, the greatest good for the greatest number, a single principle. Uh, he, he will use that to knock down the old laws that have built up over the ages and build anew a society of um, laws that accord perfectly with the principle of utility. And then maybe Rousseau might be the most exemplary figure here for Rousseau, man is by nature innocent, but society makes us evil. And so if we knock down the old social norms, then the natural goodness of the human person will shine forth. Now, so I, I think that this is characteristic of modern thinking, not just you know, liberalism as a political tradition or liberalism as a social philosophy, but many aspects of modernity is that we want life, we wanna not navigate through life, but actually remake the terrain of life. So it's like the heavenly Jerusalem where it's flat and life can be conducted effortlessly. Um, and I think when I read uh, The Unbroken Thread, but I, how I read it is basically as Sarab calling us to recognize that finding the truth and living well is gonna require us to navigate down the difficult paths of life. Um, you know, death, uh, uh, the responsibilities of being a parent, the question about whether or not God exists, the question of what my life is for, these questions cannot be answered easily that we have to, we have to, um, uh, we have to go down winding and hilly paths. And in that journey, and I, I, like I say, I think that this is, in that, in that journey, we need the old wisdom in order to be able to recognize the landmarks and read the signposts. Um, and so that's my way of, of, of describing the main thesis of the book. It's a, it's a criticism of this modern presumption that if we knock down the barriers and limits of life, that we can navigate on the smooth road towards happiness. Whereas in fact, given the, our fallen condition, given our embodied condition, our, uh, all the important questions of life can only be answered by going down torturous and difficult paths and only a fool will embark on such a journey without guides. And in that sense, the book provides us with many different guides. And so what are the things that we want to find or what are the journeys that we want to undertake? The book doesn't have a, any one particular thing. I mean, part of it is we need guidance to protect ourselves against chaos. I mean, that's what we get in this um, subtitle for the book, Discovering Wisdom of Tradition in an Age of Chaos. Um, and also we want to be in, delivered from the threat of 
a meaningless life. Uh, we want to be, we want to navigate through this relentless consumerist society. Um, we have to deal with the chaos of the sexual revolution. And um, the, I, I want to second uh, Fomunoz's commendation of the wonderful chapter on Andrea Dworkin, a wonderful use of uh, Andrea Dworkin, an unexpected resource for social conservatives like Sarab and the rest of us. Um, and we want to we want to navigate, try to navigate in a society that's increased, characterized by an ever greater inequality between the winners and the losers, between the laptop class and the working class. But I think for me, the late motif or the or the or the one journey that Sarab comes back to again and again is, and here I, I want to echo Phil Munoz's, or I want to push back a little on Phil's uh, notion that it's not enga engaging the American tradition. I agree, not directly, but I think the guiding journey is a journey towards freedom. That's what opens the book with Maximilian Kobe, and it comes up again and again and again. How can we be free? How can I become a free man? Uh, and getting rid of limits turns out not to be all that helpful in the journey towards freedom. That freedom requires what Abraham Joshua Heschel uh, calls inner liberty. Um, or in Sarab's discussion of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, that how, do, how does one attain freedom in the gulag? Uh, how do we attain freedom in a society where we're, our society is not a tyranny, although it's become more with the rope revolutionaries, our society is not so much a tyranny of oppression as it is a tyranny of seduction as advertising and consumption and the opportunities for kind of uh, limitless hedonism can seduce us and dissipate our souls to such an extent that we lack the, con the concentrated uh, strength necessary to be genuinely free. And the argument of the book is that freedom comes from commitment and devotion. Um, the Heschel uh, material that Sarab read earlier on uh, is that the accepting the discipline of the Sabbath is a is a tool to attain freedom from the 24 seven consumer culture or to attain freedom from a total work environment. And, and so I guess I would sum up by saying, I wanna sort of draw attention to uh, the, uh, th this is contrary to what a lot, what liberal culture typically says is that freedom is a removing of limits. Obviously there's an important role for that in some aspects of political life to be sure, but Sarab's thesis is that if we wanna have a free, we wanna live as free men and women, then we have to adopt a generous fanaticism. It's a wonderful uh, um, uh, formulation, a generous fanaticism. We need the fanaticism in order to attain the strength of character necessary to be free. And of course, we need generosity in our liberal and pluralistic society in order to, um, in order to journey with others who, whose account of the destination may in many respects be different. And I think one evidence of Sorab's generosity is the uh, generous way that he um, engaged and, and developed the insights of Andrea uh, Dworkin. So I'm very grateful for the book and I certainly hope that uh, many of the people listening in on this, uh, uh, this discussion buy it and read it and use it in order to develop in themselves a generous fanaticism. So thank you very much. Okay, everyone, all the panelists can uh, unmute your videos and we'll give Saurabh an opportunity to make a brief response to uh, his interlocutors and then we'll open it up for some informal conversation before we turn to the, uh, the audience questions. Sure, I'll try to be brief. So, um, uh, especially because I think I took a little bit more time than 
<laughs> was expected in my opening remarks. Um, start with um, uh, Mary, um, not much to say other than uh, gratitude um, for the fact that she liked the book. Um, and uh, add one more thing that at some, it was at some point that it clicked for me how um, the absence of regulations, various moral regulations had made us less free. Um, and one of the kind of milestones toward my reaching that conclusion was actually um, an essay by uh, uh, Mary herself uh, uh, on, on, on the anniversary of Humana Vitae and, and um, the ravages brought by uh, a kind of legalized contraception and contraception culture. And it's, and it's linked to <clears throat> threats to unborn life more broadly. So um, thank you, Mary, and uh, your inspiration. Um, to my friend, uh, Phil Munoz, uh, he raised several, I think, um, on the question of um, whether uh, American political tradition was sufficiently addressed. I'll only briefly say that uh, it, it's true that the likes of Lincoln and, and Washington are missing from the book, but I would place you know, someone like Heschel or Howard Thurman or Andrew Dorkin um, who tend to be more the modern, unusual figures that don't necessarily fit easily in a book that is properly about tradition, um, are part of the American uh, tradition as well. And um, um, as for the issue of uh, you know, cosmopolitanism versus localism, I take that point. And it's, it's one that Phil and I have also discussed privately. You know, he always says, um, your turn to a tradition was made possible by a by kind of liberal society, and yet now here you are um, denouncing um, many aspects of that society. First of all, I think it's a mistake to think of tradition as necessarily that it has to be um, local um, or national. I think there's uh, traditions can be cosmopolitan. Um, certainly Catholic tradition um, is. And um, the other thing I would point out is again, that although uh, the figures in the book are presented as one tradition. Of course, I, I recognize that really I'm talking about traditions, plural, and I let them sit in their tensions with each other. In other words, you have Seneca, who is far too comfortable for, with suicide, um, and uh, St. Augustine, who uh, obviously uh, was resolutely opposed. Or you have, um, you know, Andrew Dorkin would not, would not uh, get along with many of the other figures in the book on, on many issues. Nevertheless, I think, again, as Rusty highlighted, um, the thread that ties them together and makes them worthwhile for me, and therefore doesn't bother me the question of whether this is a cosmopolitan or a localist project, is the fact that in each of, the, in each of these figures, as they're presented, you, you meet that paradox that the, the loss of various limits or the demolition of various limits has paradoxically made us less free and that we find our freedom um, uh, in precisely in accepting limits and, and uh, this older account of freedom, which I'm not sure all of the founders shared, um, that, um, uh, uh, that freedom lies in, in limits, freedom lines in uh, self-government really means, first of all, governing the self and so forth. And then to, to Rusty, I mean, uh, not much to add because he painted that beautiful image that stuck with me. Um, well, he evoked that beautiful image from, uh, 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 from John the Baptist and then the, the book of Revelation. The only thing I would add is just to echo his point is that we get to the, to the flatland of, uh, of the heavenly Jerusalem, if you will, through the cross, which is, which is a limit, which is, which is perhaps the, the lowest valley of all through the acceptance, acceptance of the cross as opposed to attempts to circumvent it. Uh, and to uh, just through sheer ingenuity build our own heavenly Jerusalem. So again, thank you all, uh, my friends and, and Professor Sneed as well for giving me this opportunity to share the book with you early and for taking the time to, to read it and offer such wonderful, thoughtful comments. Thank you all. Let me turn back to our, our commentators and see if they have any responses brief uh, to, to uh, Sorab and his, his response to you all and your prepared remarks. Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, for those listening and watching, there's a kind of backstory of debate among many of us about how we're supposed to relate to the American 
tradition. And I really am grateful for Philip for you know, bringing that forward. I would just speak for myself here. I think that you know, Sarah sort of said, finding our freedom comes by finding our limits. And as an American, I have deep misgivings about the trajectory of liberalism as, a, as an ideology. But I recognize that that's my tradition or that's, a, that's an integral thread. That's a crucial thread of my American tradition. And so I'm pretty committed to trying to find my freedom in the sense that Sarab identifies within that, within that tradition. Um, and I think that's part of the, that's part of the, the paradox that we face, um, those of us who, who are concerned about the deracinating effects of, 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 of liberalism and some of its excesses, especially manifest in the present moment, is that I think the paradox or the challenge that we face is how do we remain loyal uh, and, and indebted to this tradition, acknowledging our debt while nevertheless um, you know, working to prevent its worst excesses from gaining the upper hand. Yeah, so I want to add to the praise uh, about the particular chapter on Andrea Dworkin because that is an especially fine example of countercultural warfare. Um, and I wanted to put one thought out there, which is that feminism has forgotten things that feminism once knew. And although she was the leader of the feminist anti-pornography movement, she was not alone. And something happened in the years between then and now, which is that feminists decided to follow the libertarian guys around and, and pretty much toe the line on whatever they said. I think the tacit bargain there is we'll give you pornography if you'll give us abortion. And I think that's the kind of collusion that goes on in those ranks. And it's always seemed to me that that is an uneasy deal. It's always seemed to me that we should try to chip away at the feminist support for pornography and start the kind of conversation, encourage the kind of fight that was going on in those ranks before with Andrea Dworkin and see if we can get it going again, because that would be illuminating for everybody. Okay, so let's then turn to our student, uh, Nick, who began, who introduced uh, our speaker in the panel to ask the first question, as is our tradition um, uh, from the audience. Well, it's nice to be part of our tradition, uh, at least. Um, Sorab, I think when, when a book like this is written, I can foresee at least two temptations that would be easy to fall into. The first, a kind of, let's say, corrupted traditionalism that lives in the past, wants to stay in the past, is, is completely afraid of anything new insofar as it is new. And the other one is actually a, a temptation on, on behalf of an audience to read a book about tradition and immediately write it off as a kind of corrupted traditionalism that only looks backward. Um, the sense I get from, from this conversation or from the chapters that I, I got to listen to, um, it seems like this book doesn't fall into those. Um, it is both hopeful and looks at posterity and it wants to be in the world now and prepare people for, for today's world and also uh, manages to maybe in a cosmopolitan way speak to people who maybe aren't within your particular Catholic worldview. Um, so what advice would you have in terms of practicing the virtues that allow you to do that, to, to avoid those two uh, potential pitfalls? Um, you know, for those of us who are, who are in the world and who want to make a change here, want to be authentically modern while remaining authentically human? That, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, the best, one of the best definitions of tradition that I, was, that I ever encountered um, came from the priest who, who instructed me before I was um, received into the church. And that definition was simply that tradition is ordered continuity. And what ordered continuity to him, to me, uh, has come to mean is precisely not a kind of nostalgic um, clinging on to whatever forms are handed down in an unreasonable way, but rather um, a kind of, um, uh, uh, and, and therefore a fear of the future, but rather a, a, a kind of integration in each person's own relationship to tradition, where you put together what is received and you have to sift through what's, what's, what's reasonable, what's useful, 
and um, what is merely just kind of what, the way we've always done things, but it may not actually be wise. Um, so, so, and so the other po possibility of fear of, of uh, I guess, not being able to approach the future, I would say, um, in fact, the lack of a tradition makes it hard to face the future because if I don't have any guardrails, um, any sense of, well, here's the path of, of precisely ordered continuity, um, I, I think the anxiety that that produces makes people less likely to actually make the leap into the future to, to, to commit great acts, which always mean kind of uh, potential sacrifices. Uh, and I see that not just among, you know, the kind of pathologies we now associate with, you know, downscale uh, workers who are increasingly, you know, uh, not getting married or, or um, things have dissolute lives and so forth. But even among my own kind of upper middle class peers, where the the, uh, the fact that they don't rest on stand on anything solid causes them never to actually make any big decisions. They just sort of keep everything in a suspended state, dating for years on, eight years, nine years. Like, what, what are you doing? When are you gonna make the make the leap? Or um, so what? What have you? I think that's. Um, an anxiety caused by not having the sense that there's a path stretching before you and then stretching ahead of you, which is ordered continuity. Can I, can I add something here? Uh, yeah, I was going to ask if the comments. Well, when, you, when, you, um, when you write the next edition, uh, I'll encourage you to add, a, add a, another chapter. I was going to mention this earlier. Uh, and I would, the question for this chapter should be, um, should I get married? <laughs> yes. Um, and it would be a tradition, a tradition, a terrific addition, um, uh, fitting into your theme uh, on how marriage is um, actually lets you live an authentic human life. Uh, it doesn't uh, tie you down as as many young people think. Maybe I'd match the question with the Hildebrands. Uh, I would say just to underline Sarab's point about. Uh, be able to leap into the future with confidence. Uh, you know, if we if we look, we when I was a when for me, I'm old enough that the word progress was a word that had a lot of resonance when I was young. And I look around today, and the big goal is sustainability. And what does that tell us? So we live in a time when the best we can hope for is just for tomorrow to be like today, and as opposed to having a future. And so part of the paradox here is without anchored, without being anchored in tradition, it's hard to have a future. Okay, so another question from the audience. Uh, this, is, this comes from uh, audience member Josh. He writes, how do you respond, this is for Sorab, how do you respond to the criticism that tradition is not self-justifying? If tradition is not simply ancestral, to what tradition should one be bound and what role does reason play in that selection process? Well, I give a, perhaps a crude answer, but yet as, a, as a Catholic, I believe that the um, you know, fullness of truth is found in the Catholic faith. Um, and there's obviously there's tradition with a capital T, which is a source of authority in the Catholic faith um, that also integrates, by the way, uh, if you, for example, read the uh, 1992 Catechism, which is a beautiful document, it integrates, integrates lots of other small t traditions into this kind of whole uh, uh, approach to ultimate truth. Um, but, uh, and so that being the case, and this also goes to the question that's often posed to me that, um, you know, you ultimately you pick the tradition and in a, in a context in which you were allowed to do that. But if you we followed you, uh, Sorab Amari, we would end up in a situation where people uh, wouldn't necessarily have the choice to sift through different traditions for themselves. And the answer that I'm increasingly um, inclined to give is that, um, I, to be honest, I'd rather not have uh, gone through the gauntlet of, of, of error in my 20s and 30s in such a way until I, I reach it. And I think it's not, it's okay for a society to, um, uh, and it is possible and was possible for most of human history uh, across history and across our different societies to give people a sense of, you know, basic truths about uh, 
of, about natural law, about uh, uh, it, what it means to be a member of your community, which rituals you undergo, what, uh, what do those rituals signify and so forth without making everyone have to kind of uh, uh, daily reinvent the wheel, wheel and say like, who am I? How do I belong? Which rituals should I perform? Um, and so um, I don't know if it's directly responsive to the question, but um, I try to integrate several criticisms I often get with, with early readers of this book in that answer. Can I add something here? Because I think uh, the, the focus on tradition, I sort of brought us there myself, is maybe so in this place because what, I mean, really the tradition I see Sarab writing in, it's really the classical and Christian tradition. I mean, the, the thought I wrote over and over in my notes was um, uh, the, the recurring theme is um, really platonic and it's having a right ordered soul of, the, of reason governing the passions. And we find this wisdom, I mean, Sarab could have subtitled the book, The Wisdom of the Past. Uh, and you can find this, um, this recurring theme of how our uh, how, how, how our reason must ought to govern our past passions and we must submit to a, a law higher than ourselves um, across the Western tradition. And even it emerges in people like Andrea Dworkin and uh, who understands that there's something wrong with pornography though she can't quite so, uh, embrace the, the older understanding. So I, I think there is, there is actually a deep tradition that Sarab um, is writing from, but it really is a sort of classical and Christian tradition which manifests itself in all sorts of ways and um, both in the past and in, in the recent past. Okay, uh, next question is from audience member, Michael. He would like to know, how can we help relay the difference between license and true freedom in the public square? This seems particularly difficult given the state of American education, lack of exposure to great works of literature and philosophy and the culture at large. So what uh, so Michael wants to know how how does one convey this uh, seemingly paradoxical notion that in fact limits are the key to freedom? So I wrote an essay for the Spectator recently um, where I think I got some of uh, got some ways towards answering that question, and the formula I came up with and it seemed to resonate with a lot of people is um, look look around you. Um, in other words, this would be a kind of negative path demonstration of look around our society and, uh, and tell me that the promise of liberation has really yielded liberation. Um, the idea that um, allowing corporate actors to, to do as they please, has it really yielded a society in which we have um, you know, a, a healthy marketplace of ideas or has it rather uh, um, uh, allowed a um, few corporations unaccountable to deploy censorship and um, even stamp out um, those legitimate, legitimate historical rights that we hold dear as, Amer as Americans. So talking about big tech um, and the kind of conformers of the, of, of the media. How is it that in a society in which absolute freedom of the press is treasured, we have such a degree of, of prevailing suffocating conformity among journalists and this tendency to silence the few who step out of line? or um, has the abolition of, of older hierarchies, has it created a more um, equal society or has it rather um, uh, uh, given us a, an especially rapacious elite that is all the more so uh, and its actions are all the more galling because they claim to be just kind of products of meritocratic genius. In all these cases, I think pointing to these phenomena and saying, look around you, look at the degradation and tell me that, um, you tell me this is freedom. Do you feel free? I often ask this question, does the free world feel, feel free? Do you, do you really feel like you're uh, um, uh, uh, the subject that liberalism promised uh, or, or, or something else? It's, it's, it's Dr. Phil's old question. How's that working out for you? <laughs> the, uh, so, and Mary, of course, has written so beautifully and powerfully on these questions about the, dis, the yeah, I mean, being a slave to your appetites is not freedom. Um, so uh, we're, we're essentially out of time. Uh, so Rob, is there anything else you'd like to say before, before we conclude? We're so grateful for you to sharing, being the first uh, launching pad for this wonderful book. And nothing other than thank you all. Great. Well, um, <clears throat> I would like to um, 
to remind everybody, uh, first of all, well, I'd like to I'd like to thank our panelists once again, as well as our author for joining us today and for all of you for tuning in. Uh, and before we go, let me remind you again that uh, you can visit the Notre Dame bookstore either physically or via their website to purchase your own copy of The Unbroken Thread for 20% off the purchase price through next Tuesday, May 11th. And be sure to visit the DeNicola Center's website, ethicscenter.nd.edu, where you can sign up for our email newsletter, learn more about upcoming events, and watch videos of uh, great events such as this one. So thank you so much for joining us. Take care of yourselves and take care of one another. God bless uh, and good night.